Hello and welcome back once again to the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast. This is episode 146. John and Wendy talk to Lewis Lessig. I'm your host, John. And I'm Wendy. How are you tonight, John? Wendy, I am well. We're well into December. And Wendy, I don't know if you remember, but we did this thing a few months ago called a pledge drive. Do you remember that? Yes, we did. I do remember. We had tremendous response from the pledge drive, and I'm not looking to have another one in December. However, some (laughs) folks may remember that we gave away a gift for that Mm -hmm. pledge drive in the form of a bottle opener. Yes. I don't know what is more appropriate for us that was also very, well, turned out a little more logistically difficult to get through the mail. (laughs) Lesson learned. And and if other podcasters decide to go with postal-friendly bottle openers, contact me before you do it so you learn from my mistakes. Yes, yes. We are fortunate, though. We have some leftovers, which is Mm -hmm. not necessarily a surprise. I ordered one time. This is a one-off deal, folks. Hollow stickers are going to stay around. Regular stickers are going to stay around. Guests that receive a special thing, those Mm -hmm. are around. The bottle openers are a one-off thing. I want to throw it out to those of you that have not received a bottle opener. Write us a review. Retweet this episode. And then message me with your address. Something. Something to help us boost the signal. International listeners, it's for you too. I have sent at least three out of the country. At least two of those three have been received. I haven't heard about the third (laughs) one. Actually, four I've sent out now. Two of four have been out. These are going to be one of a kind. I don't know, Wendy, I don't know if you call them collector's items. People love them. You know, I've heard a couple here and people love them. So Eponymous has one. Oh, there you go. We're in a brewery, folks. That's all that matters to us. But in all seriousness, if you don't have a bottle opener, and you'd like one, I'd like to send you one. Again, what we're going to ask is either retweet this episode, leave us a review at whatever platform you listen on, whatever it may be. Send me a note either through the social hour or my Twitter or however you get in touch with me. Get in touch and we'll make that happen. I want to make sure everybody that wants one gets one. And I love that people are sharing pictures and obviously using them because they are functional, believe it or not. All of you know, we love doing giveaways. I love trying to think of something new. I don't know what's going to be next year's thing. The post office or the mailing logistics is what keeps it entertaining. Mm-hmm. After what we can send. Because I obviously, we can't send certain things package wise. It's just impossible. But you never know. Might even, maybe in a bananas logo. Maybe a banana sticker. You never know, folks. You know, it's funny. This is Lewis's second appearance with the social hour. Yeah. But it's the first time he's been with us both. Yeah. I think you talked to him, gosh, like, Early on, right? Wasn't it a while? Yeah, it was, I think, before the 2018 SHRM conference. And then, unfortunately, Lewis wasn't able to attend the conference, so we didn't even get to meet in person after having a great conversation. You know, it happens. Life happens, as we have discovered in 2020. Yes, absolutely. Let's make the introduction, and we'll get right into it with Lewis. Yes, super excited to welcome Lewis back to the show. He is a partner at the law firm of Brown and Connery LLP in Westmont, New Jersey, in their labor and employment group. His career began with an undergrad degree in HR administration. And since then, he attended law school and has spent more than the last 20 years representing public and private employers of all sizes and industries before administrative agencies like the EEOC and DOL, as well as defending employers in state and federal court from a gamut of employment law issues. From pharma to defense contractors, healthcare to hospitality, auto dealers to technology organizations, food distributors to public entities, you name it. And he has some experience there. Uh, Lewis has brought a pragmatic approach to his representation of employers across the U.S., as well as advising clients on issues abroad. He is also known as the Employment Law Translator. TM. So, you know, don't just go throwing that around, folks. Lewis has been quoted and interviewed by places like NPR and presented as keynote speaker, breakout presenter, and trainer for many organizations throughout the U.S., including SHRM chapters, state councils, and the SHRM annual conference for most of his career. He has been published in various publications nationwide and has been active in various levels of the Society of Human Resource Management at the state, national, local, all sorts of levels. Lewis, welcome. Welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you here. First question, what is in your glass? Uh, Well, first, I have to tell you both, I am thrilled to be here and and with both of you. And tonight, really, uh, it's I recognize that uh, it's in the evening, but at the same time, I'm not done yet. So it's it's both water 
as well as a little bit of, and, and I apologize for those that think I'm slightly a bit uppity, but it's a little moose munch coffee. A little what? <laughs> a little moose munch coffee. A little Harry moose David. Moose munch coffee. Yes. Is that a label or is it a type of drink? <laughs> it's it, <laughs> it's flavored coffee from Harry and David's. Okay, okay. Like the popcorn they have, Moose Munch, okay. they also have coffee. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm following. Interesting. I might have to find that. That sounds good. I've always been a fan of the vendor that sends the Harry and David baskets during the holidays, I have yes. to say. <laughs> Lewis, it's funny. You're not the first attorney that we've had on the show that we're recording in the evening and said, I'm not done with work yet. <laughs> We've heard that more than once. Yeah. We've heard that more than I once. wish. I got to tell you. <laughs> we're really glad we could make this happen. Now, I have to ask, so you had this background, you got this education in HR management. How in the world then did you decide to move into the labor and employment law world? Well, you know, it's a funny story. I was doing an internship at Lehigh Valley Hospital. And at the time, they had 4,000 non-union employees. And I'm with my generalist HR person doing my internship. And he turns to me and says, do you want to do benefits your whole life? And I sat back. It took about a split second. I said, well, no, not really. And he (laughs) said, well, then you should totally go to law school. And that's really how it happened. I was like, okay, that sounds like a great idea. And sort of the rest from there is somewhat history. You know, went on to law school. And then in law school, I was fortunate because uh, one of my courses obviously was employment law. And I met one of my professors who reached out while I was in my clerkship who said, listen, I don't have a job for you, but come have a drink with us. And I went out to somewhere in Pennsylvania I could probably never find again. And I sat down and met three other gentlemen. And we ended up forming a company to do training and development in the employment space. And we did that from eh, like 97 or so until uh, 9-11. And we were doing training across the country, as well as doing the sort of the day job in employment law. And it sort of, you know, evolved from there. And it's been a a heck of a ride, I got to say. I don't know if I appreciate or am saddened by the fact that somebody would think you would spend your life in benefits. (laughs) You want to be in benefits? Well, some people may say yes, absolutely. And and I appreciate and love those people. And I know they're in my Rolodex. That was not where my passion lay. So. I was perfectly happy to not go that route. We're amongst <laughs> friends, I understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm there with you. That's one area of HR that I'm like, nope, no thanks. You know, I always tell people too that the coolest part about the work I do and that the work that you both do is that people do stuff at work they would never do at home. It is the coolest thing because every day is different, even if it's, oh, we have another harassment case. The facts are got to be different. We're dealing with more crazy people. I love this job. <laughs> well, uh, you know, along those same lines, what are some of the changes that you've seen around uh, labor and employment law in 2020 that have surprised you? Well, you know, I've been hopeful and, uh, you know, I never take a, a political slant one way or the other, but I have been hopeful for some time that we as a country would move more centrist to actually allow government to govern. We haven't really been that lucky. So I'm not really surprised by that. That's just sort of been going on. I was, though, somewhat surprised, to be very honest, about how mental health issues have really taken center stage. And in a much more pragmatic way, it's sort of like that dirty little secret that we never talk about. You know, go call the EAP. But have you ever tried to actually get a really good health care provider in the mental health space? It's difficult. It's, it's interesting because I found so much of it between, say, the end of March and June that I put together an entire program just on cognitive conversations because that had become such a major issue and had really been under the radar, but has been something that has really ballooned. And I'll be very interested to see as we go into 21, where that goes. Lewis, recently you had an article published about marijuana and state of the workplace. And it's interesting, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, you know, Wendy's home state made some pretty massive changes in in their (laughs) position on legalization. We have a lot of listeners that are in places that maybe have already have some type of marijuana laws on the books and and some that may not. What would you recommend for employers? How do you prepare for those changes when it comes to usage and distribution and the laws around them, even if it may not be 
something that your state is looking at currently? Well, you know, John, it's interesting that we have a massive challenge as employers right now. I have to give props, though, to Wendy and all of her brethren uh, in her home state because they are the first state in the nation to pass both kinds at the same time. So thank you, Wendy. For the rest of us, you know, the big challenge, particularly if you have organizations or operations, rather, in multiple states, and certainly we had talked earlier about some of the distinctions between New Jersey versus Virginia. As you go around the country, the challenge we've got right now is that every state's sort of on their own little island. The difficulty that we have in the HR space and bleeding into the legal space is that fact that we don't really know what we're talking about until we read that state-specific law related both to medical as well as recreational, if you have both. Where's the line? What's the criminalization? And then we get even further down the rabbit hole to look at, are we talking about safety-sensitive positions? Or are we talking about anybody who's impacted by federal DOT regs? Independent of what's going on in D.C., the biggest challenge when you take a look at the cases and over the last, say, 24 months, I think that there have been cases that have made it into my top 10 in the marijuana space because of the depth and breadth of sort of where courts are going. Interestingly enough, what you find is that there are certain states around the country, like Arizona, like New Jersey, like California, that are really looking towards their sister states to see how they can marry their laws with other laws. Meaning that there, there's some stuff where the courts in Delaware, for example, have looked at Arizona and said, you know what, we like that. We're going to use that. You would never see that generally. You know, normally every state's like, we're the best. Don't talk to us. We got it. And yet, because there's no federal level assistance, everybody's borrowing from everyone else. To the same degree, though, we also have to recognize that where is your population coming from? I had the opportunity earlier in my career to represent one of the largest organic wholesale distributors in the country. They came to me early on before this entire trend and said, Lewis, we have a problem. We are no longer going to test at all for marijuana because systemically we won't have any employees and we know that. And so we're just not going to test for it. Now, as we move forward and get into say that like the healthcare area, the real issue we're finding is where do we draw the line? Because if you're in New Jersey versus Virginia versus Georgia, the laws are very different. And so the question I think that HR has got to ask is, are we going to run this where it's the lowest common denominator and do it across the board to make it easier, or are we going to go regionally, state by state? And I think you need to be careful because there's nuances within those laws, even in the medical area, where you know a lot of the laws when they were first written, they don't really protect anybody from the employer's side. And what I always tell people when I'm in front of a room or virtually in front of a room is that, look, whether the marijuana itself is covered is not the point. The issue is, particularly in the medical area, what's the underlying question? What's the underlying disease or issue? Because then we get into the ADA or potentially the FMLA and other federal laws that for a adept plaintiff's attorney could become a real problem for all of us. And so we need to be very thoughtful. And I think the best thing organizations can do is look at where they are and try and prospectively look out. We all recognize right now we have crazy unemployment. And the most recent webcast that I was on as a guest, they were looking at some statistics and said that we were going to be fully back to pre-pandemic levels roughly around 2023. So if that's true, the question becomes for your organization, if you look out and prospectively to 2023, can you get the employee population you need If you take a hardline approach on this issue now, and if the answer is no, then you may want to craft what you do now in order to be able to be in the right place and position for two years from now. And I think it it becomes a really good cultural question that every organization should be asking, independent of this idea around whatever you think about marijuana. That is not the point. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge that we have in HR to get that point across to management. I think that's that kind of goes to a lot of the heart of a lot of policies that HR has. Why are we 
doing this? Why, why are we asking for this and making sure that you have a solid reason and not just because you want to, or while well, they're doing it, you know, which, you know, well, that's what, that's the way we did it at the last place I worked. So that's the way we need to do it here. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations here in South Dakota. No, oh, well, what, what are we going to do? And I'm like, well, one, you don't have to allow people to come to work high. You still don't have to allow that. Right. You allow them to come to work drunk. And they're like, oh, because they, I mean, that was their first reaction. It was all, oh, people are going to come to work high on marijuana. No, no, they're not. There might be a few people who use it a little bit more. Or I think that's been the biggest hill for us to climb over so far is just um, getting past the idea that it, it, this doesn't mean it's a free for all. And that's, I think, the biggest issue. In our firm, I actually uh, head up the group that looks at this issue for our clients. And by and large, the biggest challenge is this issue around, well, what have we done before? How do we view it later? And, you know, the, another big challenge is that you can send somebody for breathalyzer, no problem, and bam, you get it back. But for marijuana, because it stays in your system in a different way, and you can't really make that distinction in terms of, well, are they or are they not? We end up in the situation where we're really going back to a lot of some of the stuff we talked about before. I'm working right now for a client that has multiple facilities in multiple states, and they wanted a, a systemic way to take a look at this issue. And I stepped back and said, look, it's no different than looking at somebody coming into work with a bottle of Jack Daniels. I don't want to see you having an edible. I don't want you to see it lighting up or whatever else. If I do, that's different. None of these laws, even the ones that say as employers, you can't do anything, say that you have to let them smoke or do whatever it is right in front of you. But I think that that also means, Wendy, that we're going to need to do a much better job of having legitimate sensitivity training with your frontline managers. Definitely agree on that. I think Kate Bischoff has a great presentation about it. And it's like, you know, you should be training your managers on how to recognize is somebody ready and able to work when they walk in the door. And not just because of marijuana, alcohol, you know, abuses, but maybe you should be having a touch point with all of your employees when they walk in the door to at least say good morning. You know, if this is what it takes, you know, training them to be able to do that in, in a sensitive, safe way that that doesn't become a, come off as accusatory. Um, because we all know uh, everyone listening to this podcast comes up with there's one person in your head when we talk about that accusatory manner. <laughs> We've all had one. <laughs> Oh, yes. Well, and along those same lines, so we're talking about marijuana and, you know, we talked about unemployment, which, you know, obviously it's it's huge right now. Going into 2021, because you talked about 2023, so let's take it back here. What do you think HR professionals should be focused on for 2021? Well, I think there are a couple of things that are going on, some of which I, I touched on before. I definitely think that mental health is going to continue to be a major challenge that we need to address. And of course, the problem is that unlike a broken leg or someone in a wheelchair or someone who has other visual disabilities, people will look perfectly fine and not be. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge. So I think that's one area. The other piece is we're going to continue to be at least partially virtual. We cannot forget the fact that the whole harassment piece is arguably even easier for folks to infect on other people in a virtual world. And so I think that's an issue. And then as we get into, and not surprisingly, right, because we've had an election that's, you know, come January 21st, life's going to be different. Certainly things like paid leave, pay equity, accountability for the work that you do, all those things that were discussed before under a prior administration, all those issues are going to crop back up. And the question becomes to what degree I was talking with someone uh, not too long ago about paid leave. And the question that I ask for all my clients is paid leave theoretically is a great idea, but where's the money coming from to pay for it? Because for your smaller businesses, that can have a major impact on the bottom line. It'll be interesting to see where that goes and how that evolves. And by the way, that's not even touching on the whole quiet murmur around cannabis that we were talking about a few moments ago. Because, you know, we talk now and, and I'm not sure, I know John and I have this because we're a little bit closer to one another, but the travel restrictions right now, 
that are recommended are a little bit crazy. I mean, in New Jersey, I think 47 of the 50 states right now are on our don't travel to or quarantine for 14 day list. But then there's a big asterisk with a caveat. If you're trying to go to Connecticut, New York, or Pennsylvania or Delaware, yes, we know the numbers may be up, but we recognize that you still need to be able to work. Well, that raises a very interesting question because you could make the same argument as we start to talk about cannabis. You know, Governor Cuomo said not too long ago, right after the election, actually, that he anticipated that New York was going to pass recreational marijuana in 2021. As we continue to move down this path, what does that all mean for all of us? Just because, to John's earlier question, it may not be in your state right now. If a neighboring state has it, or you've got folks that are taking vacations because everybody's been hunkered down for so long, how are you going to address that stuff? So I think there's just a crazy amount of stuff, and you're going to see executive orders as well as some changes at the federal level that are going to make our lives from an employment law perspective very, very robust in 21. We've mentioned virtual a couple times, Lewis, and you helped host the 2020 Garden State SHRM Conference, and that was virtual. I know we've been in some conferences together this year virtually, but talking about that particular Garden State event, you know, what was your favorite part and, and what did you learn from that hosting experience? What would you do differently next time? I think the first thing I would do is kick my kids out. Ah. <laughs> I, I don't know that everybody knows. So what we decided to do, and it was great, we had had our keynote in advance, Greg Hawks, who, if you've ever met Greg, he sort of shot out of a cannon. And we, we were friends before any of this. That's an understatement, Lewis. <laughs> we, know, we know Greg well. Right? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Greg calls me like three months in advance, and he says, I'm coming. I don't care about the COVID. I'm coming out. My chair, Lorraine Knauss, and I call him on a Zoom call, and he's driving somewhere. And we're like, dude, you're welcome to come, but here's the problem. You have to quarantine for 14 days in order to hang out with us because like, I don't care, but then we're going to worry. We got to worry about this. That was hilarious because the blood went out of his face and he's like, well, then I can't be there for those people that are listening to this podcast that may not do a lot of uh, virtual interaction in terms of training and, and a lot of work. You may not appreciate the level of work that it takes to pull off the same amount of energy and whatnot in a virtual space. We spent time together. Actually, Greg didn't know that I did this, but we talked about how at one point we we're going to have lunch and I was literally going to go into my kitchen because Lorraine and I were in my house filming and I literally made a sandwich and held it up to the camera and passed it to Greg. What he didn't know is that I already knew that he liked Subway. So I had Uber Eats deliver him a Subway sandwich <laughs> 15 minutes before that happened. So he literally had the sandwich there. And he's cracking up off camera. Those kinds of things, that was awesome. I had some video. At one point, we had somebody do a five-minute yoga to sort of mix things up. And we got a trampoline. Uh, I haven't told my insurance carrier, please don't dime me out. But we put a trampoline in the back for the kids. So I said, well, would it be great? This is the genius that shouldn't have talked, right? Wouldn't it be great if I ran out and I came in from jumping on the trampoline? So, of course, we set it up so that when we went live, I'm outside on the trampoline and I'm running inside. And so things like that, John, I really enjoyed because I was able to bring my personality out, even though we were virtual, because we had control of the space. And that was phenomenal. But to be honest, it's not the same. And I think we all know that. There are some things. It's funny. I'm in the midst of planning our leadership conference for the spring. To be safe, I'm going to have to do it virtually. I'm trying to plan some different things there that I want to do differently from the perspective that I want people to have something in their hands. Whatever I can do to make that touch point a little bit more, I think that's important. I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to pull that off yet. I did come up with a really good idea last night at like midnight. Yes, I was still on the phone talking to somebody at that point. There is something to be said for the planning of the operation. And that was, I think, the one thing that you always want to think about the end user. And so I think you both do a phenomenal job with this podcast in terms of how you structure it and the guests that you have on and the end product. All the people that listen to your podcast around the world, the cool part is they get it and it seems seamless to them. And that is a credit to both of you and how you put this together. 
in the same way, when we're doing a conference, I'm always thinking about that end user experience. What is that going to be like? That's where I think we find the distinction between speakers that just know their topic and speakers that understand how to truly engage. And to me, that's where we need to make sure, particularly in a virtual space, that we marry as much as we can so that folks don't just tune us out like the peanuts teacher, but sit down and say, oh my God, this is where I want to be. And basically what you want are passionate people about your event, just like Greg Hawks is coming into a room. It is hard, but kudos to you for finding ways to make it engaging and interactive and creating that experience. I know there's a lot of places that just said, we're just not going to do anything or we'll you know, do it as a webinar and, and not try to pull off an event. So kudos to you for pulling off an event. I think that's great. Well, I, I'll tell you, and I, I have to give props. That conference committee was unbelievable. And I will admit now I was wrong because Greg Hawks and I talked about it about two months in advance and they told us they were going to do a three-day conference, basically the same time frame that we would do a live one. And Greg and I are like, no way, no way this is going to work. And you know what? I am happy to eat crow. It's fine. That's awesome. I love it. Louis, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of our show, which is the half hour question connection. Woo-hoo. What career did you dream of having when you were a child? Well, you know, when I was little, I was one of those latchkey kids and I really wanted to be an astronaut, but then I realized that I have a fear of heights. So that was kind of a problem. (laughs) (laughs) I too wanted to be an astronaut and I actually went to space camp. I'm totally jealous. Mark Alphonse and I both went to space camp. I went to the original one in Huntsville. I was actually there showing my age. I was there at the last camp before they started filming the movie space camp. All my counselors were like extras. It was super cool. I even had astronaut wallpaper. Yes, folks, it existed in the 70s. (laughs) Entirely true. (laughs) Who's one person you've gained your network in the last year that you think more people should know? I thought about this a lot. I don't know that I can get it to one. I can get it to two. The first is Jeffrey Klein, who is just a, a massively fascinating gentleman who talks about story. He just sees the world in a different way, and it's amazing. And the other person is Bobby Fodish, who takes networking to a completely different level. Both of these people are just amazingly fascinating and great people. When I think about the networking that I'm always trying to do, these are two people that, bar none, everybody should be connected with. Awesome. So a new HR professional asks you for one piece of advice. What do you tell them? I tell them that in high school, even though I'm only 5'5", I did play high school football. And in the locker room up on the wall was a quote from Bear Bryant. And it said, cause something to happen. You know, the best HR professionals are those that engage in what's happening and are part of the solution and not part of the problem. If you're only doing tactical things, nine times out of 10, it's because you're allowing that to happen. So you should cause something to happen in a positive way within your organization. We've talked quite a bit about your time in various levels of SHRM and and community that way. How exactly do you enjoy giving back to the HR community? John, I got to tell you, it is a true passion and a love of mine, independent of what my partners sometimes think. I've only missed the annual conference twice. Once when my grandmother passed when I was supposed to be on stage. And again, when my mother was in the hospital and I was similarly supposed to be on stage. I have enjoyed every opportunity and I would encourage every HR professional to get involved on the local or the national level. It is some of the greatest people like the two of you that anyone will ever meet and have the opportunity to find their tribe. Honestly, I would rather hang with the people in HR than I would like to hang with the folks in the ABA. Please don't tell them that. (laughs) It's just more fun. What is your favorite movie? This is hard. I will tell you that the two movies that always come to mind, one is, ironically or not, The American President, and the other is The Untouchables. Those are two movies that if they come on, I'm stopping, I'm sitting occasionally. I did try, though, there's a a scene in The American President where he tries to take the Constitution and convince his daughter that it's totally gripping. I tried that this year with my (laughs) 10-year-old. and. 
just like Michael. Do- I, it did not work. He did not get it. So I will continue to try. <laughs> How about your favorite musician or band? Unequivocally, that would be Rush. And it's been a rough year, the passing of Neil Peart. I saw every show they did since Grace Under Pressure back in the early 80s, I guess. New best friend. <laughs> that Rush Saturday, Lewis, you'll have to join us. I would say, well, let's ask the last question. And we'll go back to Rush. Okay. Uh, no problem. What is your favorite TV show? Right now, it would be uh, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. You have to find ways to laugh. The life is just too challenging right now. That's a good one, yep. Lewis, I was all excited when you said The Untouchables. On my other podcast, it was my number two movie of 1987. It's absolutely astounding. Some of the shots in that movie are just unbelievable. That Morricone score is unbelievable. The costuming is incredible. How in the world have we never talked about Rush? I don't know. Are you familiar with Rush Saturday? No, no. This show comes out on December 10th. December 12th will be the five-year anniversary of me starting Rush Saturday with Steve Brown, Kevin W. Grossman, Matt Davies. Oh, gosh. I don't know. I can't remember. Some people. uh, Doug Shaw. We started this thing five years ago on Twitter, and every Saturday morning we trade videos. And it's not just of the band. It's covers. Steve Brown is going to be – and Kevin – now, Kevin Grossman is the biggest Rush fan on the planet. Barn, like I thought my son was it, for his age. I think he's the Rush historian of his generation. But Kevin, oh man, I, I'm my mind is blown. Like I, I don't know how we're going to finish up. I'm so excited because yes, welcome to the club, my friend. Like, <laughs> like there, there's a lot of us. <laughs> this is how scary it is for me. So I was literally out of town speaking at an event when it hit the papers that Neil had passed, and I literally stopped and I had somebody come up to me and say. What is wrong? Like, who died? I turned the paper. I'm like, Neil died. And they were a little younger than I am. They did not get it at all. I'm like, you don't understand what a big deal this is. 2020 is not, let's, we're not even going to get into that. If, <laughs> if, if you're not watching The American President or The Untouchables, you're not listening to Rush, not watching Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee, what else do you like to do outside of work? These days... Life is so interesting and homebound from the perspective of what my kids were able to do. It is all about either ice or street hockey. I am constantly at some rink. My eight-year-old had uh, ice hockey practice tonight. And as I was bringing him home before we got together, the three of us tonight, he turned and said, well, you know, dad, I live on the ice. <laughs> and um, it's funny because I that was one of the few sports I was not allowed to play as a kid. But that is definitely somewhere that I am spending an awful lot of time at. And if it's not there, it's usually on the deck hockey rink. That's where we are these days. There's a lot of HR puckheads, too. we got to have those conversations if you haven't. (laughs) Yes, but it's very hard. i got to be honest. It's very hard to be a Devils fan in Flyers country. (laughs) (laughs) Our home rink is where the Flyers actually practice. And every year since my older son was five, I take my kids to a game every year. And we actually made it to two games right before they shut down in March. Oh, goodness. Finally, Lewis, it is Lewis Lessig Day all around the world. What are we doing to celebrate? We're on a beach enjoying the sun. And if we're not sitting on the beach, we're sailing out on the water, enjoying what for hundreds of years and is arguably the most coveted trophy on the globe being the America's cup and uh, something I truly love to do. Love it. It is safe to say America's cup has never been brought up on the HR social hour before. (laughs) I'm certain of that. (laughs) (laughs) Lewis, this has been an absolute joy. I'm sorry we didn't do it before, but I'm glad we're here now. And as you said, you're only 146 episodes in really do appreciate you taking time, knowing that you're still working and we're, Pulling the curtain back, we're recording right before Thanksgiving. The fact that you're taking time with us, we can't thank you enough. I know most of our listeners are probably are connected with you already, but if they're not, what's the best way for them to reach you out there? Well, they can certainly find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just search out my name, Lewis Lessig, or you can find me on Twitter at Lewis Lessig. Instagram, same deal, Lewis Lessig. You can also take a look. You can find me on my firm's website at brownconnery.com or on my website, which does more of the speaking stuff at lewislessig.com. 
we will have all that in the show notes. And then, Wendy, how about you? What's the best way for listeners to find you out there? Uh, best way is always on my blog, mydailyjourney.com. Daily is D as in dog, A-I-L-E-Y. And, of course, the second and fourth Sunday of the month, please join me on Twitter at 7 p.m. Eastern Time and for our twice-monthly Twitter chat. How about you, John? Friendly reminder, if you'd like a bottle opener, make a post, make a share, do something, let me know you did it, and we'll get one out your way. Otherwise, johntherman.com for all things John Thurman. And for the show, hrsocialhourpodcast.podbean.com. As always, anytime you listen, rate, review, share, and boost our signal, we appreciate it. International listeners, you know the deal. We're coming for you. We're getting into 2021. We want you as part of our show, having conversations like we're doing with Lewis tonight. Again, appreciate your time for being with us, Lewis. So for the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast, I'm John. And I'm Wendy. And as always, be sure to connect. Give back and network. network. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon.